Building on our cultural understanding of the interaction of bison and the people of the Great Plains, we're honored to have a dear friend, Dakota Goodhouse, an enrolled member of Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribe here to share a Lakota historical narrative based on research that he's been doing. Dakota will also be one of the on the buses tomorrow, um, so you will have interaction time with him. His winter count is spread out in the art exhibit, and so if you want to talk with him about that um, at supper time or when we've got other flexible times, um, you're welcome to do that. But uh, Dakota, I'd love to have you up here. All right, let's uh, get started. Mitaku yapi Dakota Tiwashte Emachia. My name is Dakota Goodhouse. Iyawo Slal Emata. I'm from Standing Rock. Chonte um, Wakpa El Wati. I live in Heart River Country, and uh, you'd call that Mandan, North Dakota. Wana. Uh, um, we prazuka washtewi, and so uh, that is um, right now is the month of the uh, ripe June berries, ripe June berry moon. Heche bloketu chokayawi. That's uh, it's also the midsummer moon, and um, I also want to welcome you in my language. Earlier we heard. Uh, 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 my nephew, John, uh, greet you in our language, too. So I'd like to share a few words. Ite, wanji, e pink delo. Danya lachchi, danya yahi, makoche kile, machbiat katheya. And so in English, that would be friends and relatives. Uh, it is good to see you here in the land that we call the land of sky and wind, the country of sky and wind. Uh, we have a lot of it. <laughs> uh, what else could I share? Um, oh, uh, earlier, uh, there, there's some things I, I think uh, that uh, John didn't want to touch on being a, a traditional person. Uh, I don't think of myself as a traditional person, so I feel like I can elaborate on those things. And he's not here, <laughs> so I could say those things. Uh, uh, he mentioned something about uh, our fingerprints, and so um, uh, the, the moray I grew up with regarding the fingerprints is um, uh, these inform us the direction the wind was blowing on the days that we were born, the day we were born. And so uh, I think that's really neat. We're people of the wind, uh, our peoples of the plains, because the wind is a part of our culture. Um, okay, so let's get started here. Katkanka o Hunkanka, these are uh, ancient stories of the great ones. And I thought I would uh, collect some of these stories and put them together and talk about um, what these bison mean to us as uh, native peoples and uh, various places on the landscape where we say uh, they emerged into the world. All right. Uh, when I began, I, I mentioned that this is the, uh, the midsummer moon. So I wanted to share, uh, I, <laughs> I guess this morning or yesterday, or last night I wanted to share this. A few days ago, my uh, son and I, uh, my youngest son, we uh, um, watercolored um, the, um, what, what it looked like. Uh, so being not a traditional person, I can share this with you. Uh, that constellation that uh, appeared in the, in the middle of the sky, uh, if we could peer through the, um, the blue heavens, we would see the stars in the sky. And uh, we, would, would, we would have seen around midday uh, this constellation that you would call Origa. And I don't know, I'm not Greek, I'm not Roman, so I don't know that story. <laughs> I don't know why it's called that. Uh, but for Lakota, Dakota people, this is Wichachbi um, Hinkbaye, which is the fallen star. And uh, uh, at, uh, so around midday, this constellation appeared to be uh, upside down 
and the brightest star in that constellation uh, you would call Capella. I don't know why it's called that, uh, but that is the fallen star of that constellation for uh, my people. And uh, um, around noon, around midday, not noon, it was around middle of the day, uh, uh, we held up the uh, Skyview app to see um, the fallen star and the fallen star constellation and the sun and uh, it was a beautiful magical moment it's not like my people could look up and, and pierce the blue heaven and see this but they uh, were aware that uh, the sun lined up with the arm of Wichach uh, and from that point um, fallen star sends uh, rays of light and hope to our people of the plains. It's a re re um, redeemer narrative that uh, we don't have time to go in for today. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to share that. Uh, it's, um, we're still at the, in the longest days of the summer, uh, the seven long days. Um, anyway, I wanted to share that, the uh, mid-summer moon. All right, um, I also want to, I, I like art. I, I've been getting into art, and so uh, my son and I uh, talk about uh, art, and I watch him paint once in a while when he wants to paint. Uh, when I ask him to paint, it becomes a chore. <laughs> and so that's just uh, father and son, I guess. Um, so here we have the moon, or at least I hope that it would look like the moon to you. That's the moon. Uh, the Dakota people say that in the moon, when we look at it, it's, uh, there, there's a bison there. There's a bison in the moon. Uh, so uh, um, I painted this with uh, metallic uh, watercolors on, on black paper, black cotton paper. And um, uh, hopefully you can see that um, when you look at it, when I hold it up in regular light, it, you could just see the moon, but uh, because it gathers and reflects light, you have to have to look at it from a different angle. And hopefully you can see that there, the bison is more prominent. Uh, there's a bison in the moon. The Dakota people say that. Uh, regarding the moon too, um, the uh, Lakota and Dakota people, the Ocheri Shakomi people say that um, uh, that cycle uh, of, uh, of uh, construction and uh, destruction of the moon's lodge, uh, when when the when the moon is is uh, gaining, when it becomes fuller, um, waxing, the um, that's when Hokewi, the the woman uh, that personifies the moon, when she uh, is building her lodge. Uh, whether you can imagine that as a uh, as a as a as a 13 bison hides that she sews together to construct her lodge, uh, or we're looking at uh, the bottom of her lodge into her lodge, uh, or the top of her lodge looking down, however you want to interpret that, but uh, when she completes her lodge, it looks like this with a bison in it, a bison on the moon. Uh, that um, Hokewi then, uh, let's, uh, let's look at her real quick. Uh, because when the, um, when the moon begins to wax, uh, that's because uh, there is a, a great mouse that uh, deconstructs the moon, that uh, destructs the moon, that takes it apart, eats it away until there's nothing left. And then it's gone. Uh, they say, e, this, the, the moon has died. Uh, well, not the moon has died, but her lodge has, is gone. Uh, it's also a lesson in productivity. You have to be productive if you want it to live. You have to be productive to your family, to your community, to your extended family, uh, to the nation, uh, if you want it to live. Anyway, so that was, uh, that was what life demanded uh, prior to reservation. So what are we looking at here then? Uh, the Dakota say that there's a bison in the moon. The Lakota people say that, um, uh, oh no, it's not a bison, it's, it's Hokewi herself. And so here is uh, my take on this woman in the moon. And um, let me advance my slide here. So um, this, this, is, uh, this, is what, this is how it, I had to take it. Uh, I took it uh, with the light right on it. And um, as I moved it, 
uh, the light gathered and reflected differently so that we could actually see uh, the woman in the moon. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a pretty cool thing about painting with uh, metallics. I never would have thought of you know, using a different medium, uh, different color watercolor paper to uh, produce uh, this kind of work. Um, anyway, so that's the woman in the moon and uh, they say that she stirs a spoon, a very uh, long spoon. Uh, she stirs it and um, when we see the ring amount around the moon there, they call that we ache each edi. And that means um, uh, the moon has uh, stirred her pot so vigorously the light has spilled out about the moon. And so uh, ring around the moon. Um, when we see um, uh, a bright spot in the sky, in the clouds, uh, you would call that a sun dog. Uh, we use the same word uh, ring around the moon to describe a sun dog. We ache each edi. We ache each edi literally means the luminary makes a fire for himself. And um, what a, what a, a beautiful expression on the Great Plains when in the dead of winter it's so cold that even the sun has to make himself a fire. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get to some of our stories here then. I will talk about the origins of bison, at least according to the Lakota, Dakota people, Ujeri Shakomi. Let's look at those words. Tkatanka uh, is a probably a very popular term. We probably all have heard of it by now. Tkatanka, um, it could mean bison bulls. Uh, listening to Lekshi Joseph Marshall, I'm inclined to uh, embrace his, uh, his uh, interpretation as the great ones. The great ones. Tkanka means great one anyway. It means big, massive. <laughs> uh, Tkanka. I, I just love that. The great ones. Uh, earlier, John mentioned uh, pte, pte. And that is, uh, pte is, uh, it's bison kind. Uh, all of bison, uh, the male of the species and uh, the female of the species. But uh, when it's an individual of pte, then it's the, pte means the female of the species. So pte. And then uh, there's uh, another term, pte hinchala, which is uh, the bison calves, the little ones. Uh, they're not tkatanka yet. They're not the great ones. They're the little ones. Um, let's talk about the creation of bison then real quick. Uh, hopefully I have the rest of my slides here. All right, so a lot of pictures of bison, right? I like Albert Bierstad, uh, his work. I'm glad it's in the public domain. I can use it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I have my notes here to keep myself in order and to stay on track. So I'm going to read uh, and then share and read and share. The creation of bison uh, began with an emergence from Wind Cave. Inktomi and the trickster and Anung Ite, the, uh, the double-faced woman, tricked the people into emerging into the world without the consent of, of, of creator, Tunkashila. Anung Ite, double-faced woman, sent her wolf with a pack of dyed quills, various berries, meat, and fine clothes to entice the people into following the wolf into the world. A few people were lured after eating the food and wearing fine leather clothes and followed the wolf back into the world through Wind Cave there at the Black Hills. Some refused to follow the wolf and they stayed. They remained uh, in the world. Uh, so I, this part of our story mentions Wind Cave. And I, if, I don't know if anyone's been there or not. It's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, there's a gang of bison there, and uh, there are several names for Wind Cave. And the Lakota Dakota perspective, the Ochedi Shakomi worldview, is that all the caves in the Black Hills and beyond are actually Wind Cave. Uh, that reaches as far north as the Cave Hills uh, south of Hedinger uh, in South Dakota. Uh, so in Ludlow's Cave, we'll be talking about all that stuff here, maybe tomorrow, and I'm going to mention more places here too. Okay, so washunia, uh, the, uh, the breath that resides at the hole in the ground. 
Uh, if anyone's been to Wind Cave or even uh, Medicine Hole at Kildeer, uh, the air rushes in during daytime and after the sun has set, the air rushes back out. It's like a, a deep breath, it's a great sigh. Uh, so that's what that describes. Um, Tkatoye o yuchlo kapi, the opening uh, for the four winds. Tkatke washun, literally wind cave. Onia oshoka, the breath of thought that's inside. And uh, lastly, one of the terms I've heard for this uh, place where bison emerges, macha ochloke, and that's just simply a uh, earth cave. Uh, okay, so back to our story here. When the group emerged, they were amazed at the vast blue sky, the scent and sight of all the flowers that were blossoming. The wolf led them to the lodge of double face woman where she taught them how to hunt and gather, how to prepare food and make clothing for themselves. Uh, summer became fall and fall became winter and the people had very little prepared to survive the seasons. It's their first season, their first time in the world. They returned to the lodge of double-faced woman for help. But then she unwrapped her shawl revealing the other side of her face, which is why they call her double-faced woman in the first place. Uh, she always wore a shawl or a robe pulled over her head uh, so that people, when she wanted to speak with them, only saw uh, half her face that was uh, exceptionally beautiful. Uh, people fell in love with her. Men and women, they fell in love with her, with her sight, just the way she looked. Uh, but when she removed the other half of her robe or her shawl, uh, they saw it was uh, hideously scarred. And so they were transfixed with uh, beauty and horror. Anyway, uh, they asked her for help, and she laughed at them. The people ran in fright from her, and she set her wolf on them. They sought to return to Wind Cave, but the way was covered, leaving them trapped on the surface of the world. They didn't know what to do or where to go and fell to the ground in anguish. The Creator heard their cries and came to them. Uh, the people explained uh, before, <laughs> I'm sorry, the people explained how they emerged uh, before they were even ready to emerge. Uh, this angered the Creator and he told them they must be punished. So this is uh, like the casting out of Eden narrative. Uh, we have that too. Uh, he took them. And then he gave them new form, he gave them new shape, and transformed them into bison. And they became the first great gang of bison, the first great herd. Eventually the world was prepared for people to live on it, and Creator instructed Tokahe, the first man, to lead the people into the world through Wind Cave. On their journey towards emergence, they stopped four times and prayed, their last stop being at the entrance of Wind Cave. On the vast open plain, they saw bison tracks. Creator instructed them to follow these tracks, that from bison they would acquire food, tools, and clothing. Eventually, they crafted their homes, too, from bison hides. Creator informed them that the bison would lead them to water. And we heard that uh, echoed in John's uh, story this morning. The seven ancestral leaders of the seven divisions of the Tituan, the Lakota speaking uh, Ocheri Shakomi, um, uh, they eventually became the ancestors of the Lakota people, and uh, these seven peoples, these seven souls were placed into the night sky. Uh, they call that Wichachbi um, Shakomi, Wichachbi Shakomi, that's what you would call the Big Dipper. Uh, but not all the people were ready to emerge into the world. Some chose to stay, that was their choice. Creator turned his attention to Wind Cave and the entrance contracted until it was too small for the people to re-enter. Wind Cave thereafter served as a memorial so that the people would never forget where they came from. According to Donald Montalo, 
uh, artist in South Dakota, a holy man they called Khatanka, warned the people about ascending to the world. Uh, he saw the people in a vision. They lost their language and had to invent a new one and became known as Ikcheya Wichasha. Uh, ordinary people are common people. It was Khatanka, the holy man, who came into the world and transformed into a great bison. He was willing to give up his life so that the Ocheri Shakhomi people would have food, shelter, and clothing. And that brings us to sites associated with bison emergence now. A whole bunch of them. Uh, they are, they're all over the plains. Uh, they reach into the lakes and woodlands of Minnesota. Uh, the first one is Bodote. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Bodote. Uh, that's the Dakota term uh, for where the Ocheri Shakomi emerged into the world uh, from, from, the, from under the world. Uh, they call it Bodote. The Lakota term is uh, Ojate. So uh, it is different, different dialect. Uh, Bodote, you would know that today as uh, Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling, that's it's still a sacred place. You know, that, that fort uh, hasn't been there for as long as the story of that place has been there. And we need to remember the names of these places because once they're put into English, the historical and cultural context of these places is forgotten. So that's Bodote. Uh, the next site is uh, Paha Matho Oti. That is um, Bear Den Butte. Chances are you have never heard of that. Um, but that is out by Fort Ransom, just south of uh, Valley City. Uh, it's, a, it's a little hill that uh, sticks out on the prairie. Uh, that's where the um, Ihunktuwana Dakota people, the middle Dakota people, uh, Dakota people of the plains, where they say their emergence into this world happened. Um, so that is uh, near Fort Ransom. Uh, the next one I want to share is um, Mani Waha Chante Paha. That is uh, the uh, Heart Butte of Spirit Lake. Uh, chances are you've never heard of it called that. Never heard of it called that. Uh, that is where uh, Dakota people too also say that there was uh, an emergence. So as human beings came into the world, so too did other animals. This is that place. Um, it's at a place called, uh, it's near a place about two miles uh, today called Tokyo, North Dakota. If anyone's ever heard of Tokyo, North Dakota, uh, just on the south side of, uh, of Spirit Lake. Uh, Tokyo, incidentally, too, is a, it, it's, a, it's an anglicized word from the Dakota when they encountered the, uh, the, the settlers there. Um, uh, I don't know what the, what the settlers said, but the Dakota responded, um, Tokia he, you know, um, what are you doing here? <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> yeah, what's, what's going on? What's, what's the business is taking place? You know, that kind of question. And uh, they heard uh, Tokyo. Anyway, um, yeah, what's going on, right? What a place. Uh, anyway, uh, but this, this butte there at Tokyo, uh, locals there call that um, uh, Devil's Heart Butte, if anyone's ever heard that. It's a sand volcano in North Dakota. <laughs> sand volcano. Anyway, uh, go check it out. You can see it. Uh, the next place I want to talk about is uh, Chante Paha, and that is Heart Butte. There's a lot of Heart Buttes. Uh, this one in particular, though, is out by Glen Allen. If anyone's ever been out that way. Uh, it's, a, it's a magnificent butte. It's just like right in the middle of the prairie. Uh, the next one is Pte Paha, Bison Butte. Uh, which is west of Hedinger. Only locals there call it Cow Butte. Uh, maybe we'll see it tomorrow. But it's, uh, it's called um, uh, Bison Butte. Um, about 15 miles uh, and 8 miles south of Reeder, North Dakota. Glad I have my notes here. Uh, our next site is Pahat Katanka Othi, which is uh, Bison Lodge Hill, located 6 miles or so northeast of Granville, North Dakota. Next, Khepte Waziyata. It's uh, located west and south, a few miles of Ludlow, South Dakota. That's uh, in the Cave Hill area. Uh, 
Pteohi is a bison home uh, long before it became known as uh, Ludlow's Cave. Uh, it was uh, home of the bison. And uh, uh, sometimes we have to search for these names. Sometimes after a name's been uh, anglicized, uh, the, the story's been lost. Um, well, Captain Ludlow uh, was with uh, General Custer on the Black Hills Expedition. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, after uh, the Dakota scouts and the Arikara scouts uh, reported to him uh, that this, of this very sacred place, uh, on his map it became Ludlow's Cave. <laughs> and it's kind of appropriated the landscape with name too. Um, anyway, so we gotta rediscover these names. Uh, nextly, uh, nextly, as if that's a word, right? <laughs> Next, <laughs> um, we have uh, a, a site with uh, more than one name. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about these sites in North Dakota, or uh, the Great Plains, I should say. Uh, sometimes they have more than one name. Uh, so this one is um, Pahat Kachanka, uh, also known as Pahat Kanka Wankha. Uh, and which is where the buffalo emerged from under, located uh, 16 miles north of Gregory, South Dakota. Uh, I have two more here to share. Which is the Bison Lodge door. That is uh, uh, one of the places that uh, John mentioned this morning. Uh, you know that as uh, Buffalo Gap and that's on the east side, southeast side of the Black Hills. Um, one more, one more place I'm talking about here, Washunia. Uh, it's also known as Tkatoye Oyuchlokapi, the opening of the four winds, Tkatheya'un, Onia Oshkoka, breath of, uh, the breath of life inside. Maha'ol Ochlake, earth cave, which is, uh, I've, I guess I've already mentioned that Wind Cave. <laughs> Looking at my notes here. Yeah, Wind Cave uh, National Park. Um, there is one that's not on those, this list that I, I think I should add because uh, it's North Dakota place. And that is, uh, they call it in uh, Dakota Paha Akita. That means um, uh, what you might call Lookout Hill or Lookout Mountain. Uh, in North Dakota, you might think, we don't have mountains. <laughs> but when you have prairie and then you have a plateau, uh, it's uh, like a step to heaven. And from that point, you can either go to pray or you can go there and um, look for game, which is why this place is called uh, Lookout Plateau, Lookout Hill, Lookout Mountain. Uh, when people go there to pray, the uh, Mandan and Hadadza, they call it Baish. Uh, the singing, the singing hill, the singing butte, uh, the Lakota, and some of our Dakota people here. Uh, we also call this very special place Tachja uh, Wakutepi, uh, the place where they kill deer, and it's that particular name where we get uh, kill deer uh, from, kill deer North Dakota, uh, and that medicine hole is there. It's also an emergent site. And uh, what's beautiful about this place, too, is that it's not even just my people that have an association with uh, emergence there. Other nations, too. Other nations. Okay, uh, moving on here then. Uh, sorry, <laughs> should have been, oh yeah, Wind Cave, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's uh, the natural entrance there where some white guy, you know, turn of 1900, squeezed into, and then... Um, claimed credit for discovering uh, Wind Cave. Um, I, I like to share the story of my, my great-great-grandmother. Uh, her name was Shodawi. That's my uh, maternal grandfather's um, um, paternal grandmother, uh, Shodawi, smoky woman. Uh, when she was about 20 years old, she went here, and uh, it's around 1860, uh, she went there and prayed. We knew about these places. Uh, this, just, just because some guy went there and crawled into it and, and uh, wrote a paper, wrote, wrote, wrote his, his uh, journals and letters and such and invited people over to it. Uh, no, we already knew about this. this. This is one of the many entrances to that cave system. 
And, uh, but this particular one is where my great-great-grandmother prayed at. Uh, so she didn't crawl inside it. <laughs> you know, that would be disrespectful uh, to the story of the place. Uh, but she did go to pray there. Uh, she also would go on and uh, she'd be at the little bighorn fight um, when, uh, um, uh, when Major Reno first led his attack on the Lakota people on the south end of the camp, uh, Shotawi. Uh, she got up and she rescued children. Anyway, so that's another story. Getting back to Buffalo though, right? Okay, so there's um, uh, Wind Cave. Um, and I should catch up with where I'm at here. And um, uh, I think I'm missing, some, I'm missing an image here. And um, maybe I'm... Maybe... Okay, yeah, I don't know what happened. Oh, okay. Uh, sometimes that happens when I pull something off uh, Google Slides, doesn't always upload right away. Anyway, um, getting back to the story here, I'll leave this up until I get back to it then. Uh, part of this narrative reaches back to a time uh, I've touched on already when Lakota Dakota people, Chidi Shakoni, weren't always the Buffalo people. Uh, we used to fight with each other, we used to fight enemies, and we used to fight ourselves. The Titkuan who used to fight amongst themselves a long time ago, and it was the arrival of white buffalo calf woman uh, and the gift of the sacred pipe that changed us. Uh, so we went from uh, Ikchea, Wichasha, the regular people, the common people, Pteo Yate, to suddenly being called Dakholkichiapi, uh, they who speak the affectionate language. They who speak the affectionate language. I, I love that. Uh, so she, uh, she changed the way we live. She brought a philosophy. She brought a, a covenant, right? Uh, uh, instead, of, um, instead of tablets, she brought uh, a stone pipe. Uh, anyway, uh, before the pipe, the people prayed at sacred sites with stone elements, like summits, caves, and stone arches. I don't know if anyone has seen a stone arch in North Dakota. We have them. There are stone arches in North Dakota. Uh, there's a there's handful out at Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Um, uh, maybe the rangers there know where to find them. I think a few people know where to find them. Uh, anyway, we do have stone arches. We even have a river, Ochloka uh, Wakpa, which is what you might call, um, I think it's that river that diverges uh, north and west of Minot. Uh, it used to be called Mouse River, Soros River, right? Yeah, anyway, there's a stone arch on someone's, uh, someone's private land today. Uh, maybe that person is hearing this story. I'd love to visit that place sometime. Uh, but it's private land. I can't name the person. I can't, I can't pinpoint the location. Um, but it would be beautiful to see it. It'd be beautiful to take some pictures and share that story. Okay. Uh, they called themselves Ikchea or Kamen. They called themselves Pte Oyate or the Bison people. When the pipe came, they called the pipe Chanumpa, and it represented air and stone, heaven and earth, masculine and feminine, the here and the now. The many Kowoju Lakota people. Um, their name translates as planters by the stream. They were experiencing hard times a long time ago. Hunters returned with little or no game and fighting amongst their people followed. They selected two scouts to go out and search for bison. The scouts went out in twos. Uh, they say uh, this particular phrase here, Dungwea ki numpa pahaya takia, which is uh, the scouts went out to the hill. Um, that has dual meaning. Uh, to go to the hill, it means uh, to go to pray, but it also means to go out and uh, look, to go out and look. Uh, okay, so back to this. Uh, well, while they were up there, they, they spied uh, a woman approaching them dressed in white. And uh, of these two scouts, one saw her, this uh, overwhelming beauty, and was overcome with base instinct to... Uh, uh, take her for himself. And uh, she didn't run. This man went to her, one of these scouts went to her, and uh, in a moment, uh, clouds came around them. It's almost biblical. Uh, lightning shook around, shook the air, thunder rolled. And uh, when, it, when the cloud cleared, uh, human 
uh, remains were at the, at the feet of this woman, just the bones there. And depending on who you talk to, uh, maybe she was wearing a, a sweet grass on her dress. Maybe uh, the snakes were writhing in, in that scout's bones. Um, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't. There's, there's several story, variations of the same story. The thing here is, the big takeaway is that the remaining scout returned to his people and let them know what happened. And he was so moved and inspired by um, the, the beautiful contact, the constructive, productive contact he had with white buffalo calf woman. He came back uh, a changed person. This was a simple scout who was suddenly blessed with what you would call charisma. And he was able to bring all the people together. They prayed together and she came to the camp bringing the gift of the sacred pipe. Um, moving ahead here, because my story is lengthy. Um, <laughs> um, when did she come? When did this happen? Uh, I used to ask my grandparents this. I, any, anytime I hear look, traditional stories, I, I often wonder, where did these stories come from? When did that happen? And um, sometimes the people I'd ask wouldn't answer, or else when they answered, they would say, a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, I had to be satisfied with that. I never was, but I had to be satisfied with it, or at least appear to be satisfied. Um, one day, I picked up a copy of, uh, of the Batista Goodwinter Count. Uh, well, there's a, a copy of it on, uh, in the archives, right down the hall. You can see for yourself. Anyway, Batista Good or High Hawk, uh, the very first entry uh, on his winter count. Winter count's a pictographic record. Each picture represents a year. The first entry on his winter count, Wanietu Ehani Ptehinchala Sawiahi. That's the year that white buffalo calf woman came. And when we count back on winter counts, we count back the pictures and we could find that she brought this gift of the pipe to us uh, around 901 AD. So about 1,100 years. Uh, beautiful story. And now my curiosity is satisfied. When did she come? Uh, so this winter count says that. But where did it happen? Well, for that, we have to turn to someone uh, like uh, Lexi Orville uh, that John mentioned earlier, uh, pipe keeper of the Ocheri Shakoni. Uh, white buffalo calf woman brought this gift of the sacred pipe to a very special place that the Ocheri Shakomi people call uh, Matotipila, uh, Bear Lodge. Uh, you would know that as Devil's Tower, Devil's Tower, Wyoming. Uh, anyway, uh, that's where that happened. She brought the gift of the sacred pipe there. Um, when we, uh, well, so I shared this uh, constellation at the beginning of my time, and like, uh, my, my nephew John, he, uh, he talked about uh, constellations and such, but um, this is my area of expertise, but my understanding is if we treat constellations as if they're artifacts, we can uh, reach back to the time when John had mentioned the sun passing through uh, a constellation. When we, when we can calculate that, when did that happen? When did that begin? Uh, we arrive at a timeline of some time as early as maybe 2600 B.C., now, there's uh, an institutional belief when we crack open a history book that says uh, Tituan Lakota people came onto the plains in 1682. Uh, the, the French who wrote those records never encountered Lakota-speaking people. When they produced their maps, uh, they pinned a location at Big, Big Stone Lake in South Dakota saying, that's where they are. Well, we were already on the plains hunting bison and living constructive, positive lives with each other, uh, learning and living uh, the affectionate language. Okay, so wrapping this up, I think I'm getting close to the end here. <laughs> um, let's uh, skip a few things, right? <laughs> um, a few things I think I wanna share um, that are shared by, uh, by women. So, um, I, I came to know these because my mom, in her foresight, made my brother and I learn how to tan a hide, tan a buffalo hide. And uh, I remember just it being a hot, still July afternoon with the hide staked out on the ground and uh, no wind. 
<laughs> so I just remember it. My brother and I were almost crying because we didn't want to do it. Uh, anyway, uh, so my mom made us do that, and I can appreciate uh, the skills and productivity of our of our Ochedi Shakomi women. On that note, Dungwe um, de uh, Joyce Kitson, an enrolled member of Standing Rock, she said uh, to me that the good Lakota woman could tan a hide by herself in four to six hours. Now, if anyone's ever met her and you shake her hand, ooh, man, uh, it's uh, stronger than a farmer's grip, I'll tell you that. And you can just see her, uh, the muscles in her hands. That's, that's her way of life. She's living it and she's uh, uh, passing that on. Anyway, uh, and she considers it an honor to do that, to, to tan a hide. Uh, my, my aunt, uh, Evelyn Buckley, my Dungui, uh, Evelyn Buckley, uh, she says that a good Lakota woman, the productive woman, can butcher a bison by herself in four to six hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, so how does that even happen, too? Well, when we go to a butcher shop, we can see, you know, different cuts of meat, names for cuts of meat, right? Uh, when an indigenous woman cuts bison, they, they take the muscle and, and then uh, cut it away from the other muscle and other tendon. And then they take that mass of meat, that muscle, and cut it so it's like an accordion. And they pull it apart and dry it. So that still happens. That still happens. Uh, anyway, okay, so getting back to this here. Uh, there's some sites associated with uh, white buffalo calf woman, and some of those sites are on, uh, just around um, Bear Lodge for one, or Devil's Tower. Uh, Chanum Oak A, which is the pipestone quarry, and that's in Minnesota. Ian Sansapaha, that's a, a, a beautiful, sacred place long before the massacre that happened. You know that as Whitestone Hill. Whitestone Hill. White Buffalo Calf Woman came there too, long time ago. Sometimes she's also seen uh, at Sundance. Um, let's see, as I, as I wrap up uh, uh, my words here, um, there is uh, uh, the story of the horse that changed how he hunted bison. So I want to share this real quick. It's uh, one page and I can get through it. Waniyetu uh, ehana shungnuni otaki. They say uh, a long time ago that they saw many wild horses running freely. Uh, this is recorded in the Drifting Goose Winter Count. Uh, there's a copy of this at the North Dakota State Archives just down the hall. Um, well, how do we know when the horse came then if we have our record, this pictographic record? Well, we count back and we find that uh, the, horse that we, the horses we saw running freely uh, were in, uh, was in... 1692, 1692, um, and that's significant. Uh, when we crack open history books like Thomas Mail's Mystic Wars of the Plains, Royal Hasricks the Sioux, uh, or any other book on Great Plains Indians, you're gonna see uh, the horse arrived sometime around 1750. And you go find those notes, and um, it's, it's uh, uh, white legacy historians uh, quoting each other and uh, it suddenly, in the past 50 years, it's become fact. Uh, well, if you visit Fort Lincoln State Park, there's a Mandan village there. And uh, 20 years ago or so, Dr. Fred Schneider uh, recovered horse remains and uh, dated those horse remains at around 1700. This is significant. It's uh, at least a few generations before when accepted historians say the horse arrived. So back to the story here. Kunshi Mary Louise Defender, grandmother Mary Louise, tells a story of two Dakota scouts who crested a hill and saw horses emerging from a swirl in the mini Shoshe, the water astir, the Missouri River, as a thunderstorm was approaching on the horizon. The horse was invited back to camp and became inseparable from daily life. The late Pete Looking Horse recalled the first horse encounter with a song called Thunder Horse, which commemorates the Dakota's first encounter with the horse as it emerged from the water. Wankantaya Tokak 
keya ichahelo shunga wan khanwa tokahe kech un makhbia ichahelo ichahelo uh up above when they saw this uh horse approaching the first time they saw it there were clouds in the air and this horse when it first came it appeared to grow uh so that's the perspective of it as if the horse were actually emerging from a swirl in the Missouri River. Uh, so we have uh, this um, archeological evidence that the horse sometime around 1700, uh, the pictographic record that says the horse came around 1692, and uh, oral tradition places this um, uh, at Chansansa uh, Wakpa Ojate, the fork of the creamy white tree river. Uh, you would call that James River in South Dakota, 1692, we saw horses there. This is why we need to remember these places. If we don't remember the original names of these places, we forget these stories. Uh, lastly, to, to wrap this up then, um, we have these uh, circular depressions on the prairie. Um, there is a whole bunch of these depressions out, uh, by Kildeer Mountain, just depressions. Uh, I remember visiting there and seeing those depressions and uh, the people I was with uh, wondered, uh, is, is this Earth Lodge depressions? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think like other people, I guess, you know, but uh, it looked to me like this is what it was right here, this uh, painting by George Catlin, these bison depressions in the ground. Uh, those depressions would uh, collect water. Uh, the, uh, the bison would deposit um, seed from their consumption across the plains. Uh, this is where Khantasha, uh, Khantahu, the wild plums would grow. This is where the bison danced. This is where they danced. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, oh, oh, lastly, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, um, the last story here, uh, very short. Um, the first spring moon for Lakota people, we call that um, Hukshi uh, Chekbawi, the uh, what you would call in English the Pasquay flower moon. Okay, so some of you have seen it. Beautiful little flower. Um, Dakota Lakota people, our other native peoples, we use this flower to treat arthritis. <laughs> you know, I'm getting there. I might have uh, have to get uh, 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 Pasquay flower tattoos on my hands <laughs> to help me with arthritis. They they believe that anyway. Uh, so there's the Pasquay flower, uh, but sometimes that flower, it comes up, it comes up white. I don't know if anyone's ever seen a, a white Pasquay flower. Uh, very difficult to find because they come up sometimes when there's still snow on the earth. There's snow, still snow on the, round, on the ground. It's a, uh, um, it's a uh, ice age flower. Uh, just a beautiful flower. Um, when it comes up white, the Lakota people say that's where a bison drew its last breath. It's a very, very special place, very special place when you find a, a, a white, um, a white Pasquay flower. I think, uh, I think I've probably gone over my time. <laughs> very sorry. Uh, Pilama Yeye, thank you, thank you very much.